Hi, my name is Lauren, and I will be reading the first two chapters of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. So chapter one, here comes Charlie. Um, these two very old people are the father and mother of Mr. Bucket. Their names are Grandpa Joe and Grandma Josephine. And these two very old people are the father and mother of Mrs. Bucket. Their names are Grandpa George and Grandma Georgina. This is Mr. Bucket. This is Mrs. Bucket. Mr. and Mrs. Bucket have a small boy whose name is Charlie. This is Charlie. How do you do? And how, how'd you do? And how'd you do again? He's pleased to meet you. The whole of this family, the six grown-ups, and the little Charlie Bucket live together in a small wooden home on the edge of a great town. The house wasn't nearly large enough for so many people, and life was extremely uncomfortable for them all. There were only two rooms in the place altogether, and there was only one bed. The bed was given to the four old grandparents because they were so old and tired. They were so tired, they never got up out of it. Grandpa Joe and Grandma Josephine on this side. Grandpa George and Grandma Georgina on this side. Mr. and Mrs. Bucket and little Charlie slept in the other room, upon mattresses on the floor. In the summertime, this wasn't too bad, but in the winter, freezing cold drafts blew across the room all night long, and it was awful. There wasn't any question of them being able to buy a better house, or even one more bed to sleep in. They were far too poor for that. Mr. Bucket was the only person in the family with a job. He worked in a toothpaste factory, where he sat all day long at a bench and screwed on little caps on top of the tubes of toothpaste after the tubes had been filled. But a toothpaste cap screwer is never paid with much money, and poor Mr. Bucket, however, hard at work, and however fast he screwed on the caps, was never able to make enough to buy one half of the things that so large a family needed. There wasn't even enough money to buy proper food for them all. The only meals they could afford were bread and margarine for the breakfast, boiled potatoes and cabbage for lunch, and cabbage soup for supper. Sundays were a bit better. They all looked forward to Sundays because then, although they had exactly the same, everyone was able to have a second helping. The buckets, of course, didn't starve, but every one of them, the two old grandfathers and the two old grandmothers, Charlie's father, Charlie's mother, and especially little Charlie himself, went about from morning till night with a horrible empty feeling in their tummies. Charlie felt it worst of all, and although his father and mother often went without their own share of lunch and supper so that they could give it to him, it still wasn't nearly enough for a growing boy. He desperately wanted something more filling and satisfying than cabbage and cabbage soup. The one thing he longed for more than anything else was chocolate. Walking to school in the morning, Charlie could see great slabs of chocolate piled up high in the shop window, and he would stop and stare and press his nose against the glass, his mouth watering like mad. Many times a day, he would see other children taking bars of creamy chocolate out of their pockets and munching them greedily. And that, of course, was pure torture. Only once a year on his birthday did Charlie Bucket ever get a taste of a bit of chocolate. They saved up their money for the special occasion. And when the great day arrived, Charlie was presented with one small chocolate bar to eat all by himself. And each time he received it on those marvelous birthday mornings, he would place it carefully in a small wooden box that he owned and treasure it as though it were only a bar of solid gold. And for the next few days, he would allow himself only to look at it and never touch it. Then, at last, when he could stand it no longer, he would peel back a tiny bit of the paper wrapping at one corner to expose a tiny bit of chocolate, and then he would take a tiny nibble, just enough to allow the lovely sweet taste 
on the spread out slowly over his tongue. The next day, he would take another tiny nibble, and so on and so on. And this way, Charlie would make his six-penny bar of birthday chocolate last him for more than a month. But I haven't yet told you about the one awful thing that tortured little Charlie, the lover of chocolate more than anything else. This thing for him was far, far worse than seeing slabs of chocolate in the shop windows or watching other children munching bars of creamy chocolate right in front of him. It was the most terrible, torturing thing you could imagine. It was this. In the town itself, actually within the site of the house in which Charlie lived, there was an enormous chocolate factory. Just imagine that. And it wasn't simply an ordinary, enormous chocolate factory either. It was the largest and most famous in the whole world. It was the Wonka's factory. Owned by a man, Mr. Willy Wonka, the greatest inventor and maker of chocolates that there has ever been. And what a tremendous, marvelous place it was. It had huge iron gates leading into it and a high wall surrounding it and smoke belching from its chimneys and strange whistling sounds coming from deep inside it. And outside the walls, for half a mile around in every direction, the air was scented with heavy, rich smell of melting chocolate. Twice a day, on his way to and from school, little Charlie Bucket had to walk right past the gates of the factory. And every time he went by, he would begin to walk very, very slow and he would hold his nose high in the air and take long, deep sniffs of gorgeous chocolate smell all around him. Oh, how he loved that smell, and oh, how he wished he could go inside the factory and see what it was like. Chapter 2. Mr. Willy Wonka's Factory In the evenings, after he had finished his supper and watery cabbage soup, Charlie always went into his room, of his four grandparents to listen to their stories, and then afterwards to say goodnight. Every one of those old people was over 90. There was a shriveled, they were shriveled as prunes and as bony as skeletons, and throughout the day, until Charlie made his appearance, they lay huddled in their one bed, two at either end, with nightcaps on, to keep their heads warm, dozing the time away with nothing to do. But as soon as they heard the door opening and Charlie's voice saying, Good evening, Grandpa Joe, Grandma Josephine, Grandpa George, and Grandma Georgina, then all four of them would suddenly sit up, and their old wrinkled faces would light up the smiles of pleasure, and the talking would begin. For they loved this little boy. He was the only bright thing in their lives, and his, and his evening visits were something that they looked forward to all day long. Often, Charlie's mother and father would come in as well and stand by the door listening to the stories that the old people told. And thus, for perhaps half, of the, half an hour every night, this room would become a happy place, and the whole family would forget that, it would, that they were hungry and poor. One evening, when Charlie went in to see his grandparents, he said to them, Is it really true that Wonka's Chocolate Factory is the biggest place in the world? True, cried all four of them at once. Of course it's true. Good heavens, didn't you know that? It's about, fi- it's about 50 times as big as any other. And is Mr. Willy Wonka really the cleverest chocolate maker in the world? My dear boy, said Grandpa Joe, raising himself up a little higher on his pillow. Mr. Willy Wonka is the most amazing and most fantastic, the most extraordinary chocolate maker in the world. I thought everyone knew that. I knew he was famous, Grandpa Joe, and I knew he was very clever. Clever, cried the old man. He's more than that. He's a magician with chocolate. He can make anything anything he wants. Isn't that the fact, my dears? The other three old people nodded their heads slowly up and down and saying, absolutely true. 
just as true as it can be. And Grandpa Joe said, You mean to say I've never told you about Mr. Willy Wonka and his factory? Never, answered little Charlie. Good heavens above, I don't know what's the matter with me. Will you tell me now, Grandpa Joe, please? I certainly will. Sit down beside me on the bed, my dear, and listen carefully. Grandpa Joe was the oldest of the four grandparents. He was 96 and a half, and that is just about as old as anybody can be. Like all extremely old people, he was delicate and weak, and throughout the day he spoke very little. But in the evenings, when Charlie, his beloved grandson, was in the room, he seemed in some marvelous way to grow quite young again. All tiredness fell away from him, and he became as eager and as excited as a young boy. Oh, what a man he is, this Mr. Willy Wonka, cried Grandpa Joe. Did you know, for example, that he has himself invented more than 200 new kinds of chocolate bars, each with a different center, each far sweeter and creamier and more delicious than anything the other chocolate factories can make? Perfectly true, cried Grandma Josephine, and he sends them to all four corners of the earth. Isn't that so true, Grandpa Joe? It is, my dear, it is and all the kings and presidents of the world as well. But it wasn't only chocolate bars that he makes, oh dear me, no. He has some really fantastic inventions up his sleeve, Mr. Willy Wonka has. Did you know that he invented a way of making chocolate ice cream so that it stays cold for hours and hours without being in the refrigerator? And can you can even leave it lying in the sun all morning on a hot day and it won't go runny? But that's impossible, said little Charlie, staring at his grandfather. Of course it's impossible, cried Grandpa Joe. It's completely absurd, but Mr. Willy Wonka has done it. Quite right, the others agreed, nodding their heads. Mr. Wonka has done it. And then again, Grandpa Joe went on speaking very slowly, now so that Charlie wouldn't miss a word. Mr. Willy Wonka can make marshmallows that taste of violets and rich caramels that change color every 10 seconds as you suck them, and little feathery sweets that melt away deliciously the moment you put them between your lips. It can make chewing gum that never loses its taste, and sugar balloons that you can blow up to enormous sizes before you pop them with a pin and gobble them up. And by the most secret method, he can make lovely blue bird eggs with black spots on them. And when you put one of those in your mouth, it gradually gets smaller and smaller until suddenly there is nothing left except a tiny little pink sugar baby bird sitting on the tip of your tongue. Grandpa Joe paused and ran the point of his tongue slowly over his lips. It makes my mouth water just thinking about it, he said. Mine too, said little Charlie, but please go on. While they were talking, Mr. and Mrs. Bucket, Charlie's mother and father, had come quietly into the room, and now both were standing just inside the door listening. Tell Charlie about the crazy Indian prince, said Grandma Josephine. He'd like to hear that. You mean Prince Pondicherry, said Grandpa Joe, and he began chuckling with laughter. Completely dotty, said Grandpa George. And very rich, said Grandma Georgina. What else he do, asked Charlie eagerly. Listen, said Grandpa Joe, and I'll tell you.